the reduce function docs. Uh, sorry, results. So this is the map reduce, but the, the way that it works, what I can do, I can incrementally update things because I can execute each of those separately. Uh, now we have a few questions, so let's start uh, to answer them. So, uh, Michael, I'm not going to, uh, to, answer, to say the names because I will murder them. So, Michael is saying, why did you split it into two queries? And the reason for that is specifically that, so I can execute them in independently and in, pa and in parallel. Think about what happens if I'm going to, I have a thousand documents in the database, and the thing that I need to do then is to add a new document. If I had just a single operation, that would mean that I have to reevaluate the entire thousand and one documents. But by splitting that into two stages, I can actually evaluate only the new document over the map. So but just basically run the map function with like that, and then execute the reduce result again over only the thing that have changed. So this is very efficient to do. And so next question is by Stephen Pardo. Is there any transparency into the index result set from the map or map reduce? And that is an interesting question. Uh, here is the result set that you get. Uh, we don't have enough uh, screen real estate here, so let's do it like this. Okay, so here is the result set from the map reduce. We can issue queries over that, but basically this is what is what gets outputted. And so, wouldn't you need the join? In, so, Kyle Nunnery is asking, don't you need the join to uh, join the artists and the albums? And this is a very interesting observation. Let's look at what albums are. This is an album document. And an album document is basically, it's not a flat property. It's just, just a flat uh, a property list. And this is not just column value that you may be familiar from a relational database. This is actually a complex object. You can see that inside the album we actually have a complex object called artist that contains the ID and the name. So no, we do not have to do any joins. That data is available directly inside that document. And this is a very powerful uh, thing to have because it means that we have a it makes it so much easier to work with complex data types, with collections, with associations, because you no longer have to split things up into six different tables just because uh, the database forces you to do that. You can put everything inside a single document and load it and save it very, very efficiently. And Stephen, uh, Stephen, can you put in another question? Because Stephen just asked, Basically, can we see what is in the final variable? And I think that I've shown that. If you have any questions uh, regarding that, I will answer that if you ask, ask it. And Lee Atkinson is saying, as RavenDB uses RDBMS, ESA WD for its storage, are there any plans to support SQL Server for storage? So RavenDB uses ESENT, which is not a relational database. ESENT is an ISOM a database, which ISO stands for Index Structure Storage Something. Uh, this is not relational. The, da the data is structured in the form of table and rows, but this is not, a, not relational in any way, shape, or form. As for supporting SQL Server as the backend store for AvenDB, no, there are no plans of doing that because, frankly, it doesn't really make any sort of sense. Uh, if you have a really good reason why I want to do that, I would be very happy to hear about that. Uh, just send me an email for that. Uh, more questions. Uh, so again, for Michael, the last one is doing exactly the same as the force plus grouping. Yes, that is, uh, again, that is what we have talked about with regard to the queries, that we have to split them so we can execute each of them independently. 
Uh, Stasis is asking, the reduce is always based on the result of the map. Yes, it is. Exactly. And Anu is asking basically the same thing. And what is important to understand that Intel and inside RavenDB, this is actually a recent change. What we are doing, we have the map function and we have the reduce function. And the way that it works, we have docs, we have a, this is a few docs that have changed since, a, changed since last indexing. So what we used to do was something like, something like that. Okay, uh, and there is, um, this is extremely, 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 extremely simplified. And basically, we take the updated docs and we will we execute the map function on them. And then we take the mapped result and persist them to disk. And the reason that we persist them to disk is that uh, think about the case where we want to group by the user ID. So let's say that we have all of the posts for this user and we want to show the post count. So we just got a new, uh, a new post for this user. We cannot just execute the reduce over just the, the values from the uh, mapped result. We also have to look for all of the uh, mapped result that share the same uh, user ID. And this is why we have to do it in two steps. The fun part is that uh, we can optimize that even further. And what we're actually doing is this. So this is the recent change. Now we no longer persist just the mapped result. We do a first chance reduce in them before we actually move on. And the reason for that is that this allows us, this is the first step in uh, something that we call reduced scopes, which allows us to handle more efficiently large amount of information that share the same reduced key. Uh, basically, think about it in this fashion. Uh, this allows us to make sure that the number of values that we, lo that we have to reduce is uh, become smaller. What it means is that the first time that we execute the reduce is on the actual result from the map function. The second time that we execute the reduce is on the values that were saved to the uh, to disk, which includes the uh, newly uh, the new values and all of the uh, and all of the uh, extra values that were previously saved. And that value was generated by, is the output of the reduce function. So the reduce function have to be able to operate over its own output. As you have seen, this is usually trivially easy. Let's look at the map reduce function. As you can see here, this reduce function have absolutely no problem in uh, operating over its own data because the shape that it accepts and the shape that it outputs are the same. Uh, okay, so Ryan is asking, if we add one document to store and we execute the map query for that new document, wouldn't we still have to execute the reduce query on the entire set and not just the one new result? Uh, no, this is the fun part. Because of the way that it works, let me see if I can pull up the appropriate visualization. And so on here, okay. So let's take a look at what we have here. On step one, you can see that we have the raw data, all of the new documents. And you can see that here is the aggregation function that we execute. And you can see that we execute that in several batches. 
If you remember, you remember that I told you that Reduce has to operate over its own output? This is one of the major reasons for that. Because we have split that output into several batches, what we can do now is when we add a new item, we are only going to have to reevaluate batch 4, which is here. And once we have evaluated that batch, all we have to do is take these four values, the values of executing the reduce on batch 1, the value of executing the reduce on batch 2. I think I actually have it here. You see it here? So here is the value of batch 1, the value of batch 2, the value of batch 3. Then we execute the reduce on their result as well. And finally we get to this stage, we have, we have that, and this is the final stage. So basically what we have done, think about it as a way of doing a binary tree. So at each stage of the tree we only have to operate over a small amount of information. So let's say that we have one million uh, documents that we have reduced. So what we can do now is say something like that. Okay, we've just added a new document. We have mapped that. This is an O O one operation because we only have to work over a single document. Now we need to reduce that value over the entire data set. But because reduce can operate over its own output, that means that we can that we can work in batches. Let's say that every batch is a thousand uh, items in size. Okay, so. The first thing that we did, so we have divided things into a thousand. So now we only have to, to do a batch of a thousand. So this is, again, O1 operation over a thousand. And the next stage is, okay, now we have a new batch. Now we have to do the secondary batches as well. So this is another operation over 1,000. So we have one map operation and 2,000 uh, uh, reduce operation to do the entire calculation. This is over 1 million uh, documents in the result set. So as you can imagine, this is, this is very efficient. Uh, so this is how MapReduce works and this is uh, how we can do things very efficiently. Let's see what else. Uh, I think I'm getting too hung up on questions, so I'm going to do just a few more and then continue with the discussion, then give you time for questions after all. Uh, okay, so Daniel Lang asks, what is the reason for having this specific collection here? And couldn't we just go to the artist collection? Well, the answer is that there is no artist collection. This was an intentional design choice when we uh, built the when we actually built the uh, sample, da sample data specifically to show how we can use MapReduce to generate data that is hidden all over the place. Uh, Stacy, will it possible to have a link to the blog post? Yes, I will put it in the link to visual MapReduce. I will put it in the notes. Uh, is there a way to interactively execute the link query against the collection without MapReduce? Uh, this is a question by Ron, and the answer is no. We used to have one, we decided that this is a bad idea, and we basically don't allow it anymore. Uh, if you really want that, you can actually execute and uh, generate the index, get the values back, and then uh, delete that, but that's about the only, the only way to do that. Uh, do you know anyone, so Nick Van Matter uh, asks, do you know of anyone that has used a load balancer on the next scalar to load balance revenue be used on replication between nodes? Do you see any roadblock in implementing this? So I don't know anything about a uh, network here, so next scalar, I don't know what this is, but doing load balancing between nodes is something that actually come up very frequently when we talk about running inside uh, Azure or running inside EC2. And the main, the, main, uh, the main issue here is how do we want to actually structure that. Uh, I know of people who are doing that. There are several options that we have to select and that would be a great, uh, great scenario for doing 
uh, webcast on uh, 